You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... At the end of the show, we're going to have an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. This audio clip is narrated by the one and only Luke Daniels. You're going to love this series. I love it so much. And uh, Richard has been a great supporter and sponsor of the show, and we're going to show him some love. Listen to the audiobook excerpt. You're going to love it. And uh, be sure to go to audible.com to purchase it. If you're not an Audible subscriber, you can get a free book just by signing up for a free trial at audibletrial.com slash Hank. You get a 30-day free trial. You get the free book. If you decide to cancel your Audible subscription, you get to keep the free book. and It doesn't cost you a single penny. Audibletrial.com slash Hank. And uh, listen after the show for the clip from Richard Fox. Writers, I have an amazing tool to tell you about. A revolutionary writing tool for planning stories, Campfire Pro is what novelists need to go from the seed of an idea to a detailed plan that's ready to be executed. Complete your character design, create a timeline, and track your world building all in one place with our downloadable desktop app for Mac and PC. Without the annoying subscription model so many apps are using today, visit campfiretechnology.com for special holiday pricing on Campfire Pro today. Who wants to love a billionaire? Billionaires in New York, book one by Laura Burton. Do you have a favorite writer whose books are auto buys for you? Wouldn't you love for readers to have you on their auto buy list, then recommend your books to their friends and on social media? The good news is there are subtle things you can do, things that are nearly invisible to the reader, that will make your stories unputdownable. The Beyond 10 Days course from Victory Editing can help you get the most from your stories and help you build that relationship with readers through your writing. This course is full of awesome, and best of all, you don't have to fly across the country or put on pants. In this course, we'll focus on avoiding info dumps, dialogue mechanics, show versus tell in dialogue, carrying show versus tell forward to your narrative, deepening your point of view and strengthening your protagonist's voice, overwriting and how to avoid it. 10 hours of video content with text and audio downloads. Shine that diamond. Join me at the Beyond 10 Days course. Go to hankgarner.com and click the banner to sign up today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Kylie Reed on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book. It's called Such a Fun Age, and uh, I I love this book, Kylie. I told you before we we started, and I think a lot of other people will, too. Um, Welcome to the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you, and uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Okay, I think I do have this one. Uh, when I was 14, I had a teacher uh, telling up, like paraphrasing this scene in the Odyssey. And she was telling it very slowly, and I felt so gripped. I kind of forgot myself. And the school bell rang, and it kind of zapped me out of wherever I was. And I realized I had kind of forgotten myself in her storytelling. Um, I'd always loved storytelling from when I was very little, but that was a moment where where I thought, okay, I think I might want to do this. That's that's fantastic. I, I love those stories of uh, of someone else who ignites the fire. Um, d- did you ever have a teacher or uh, a parent, some other adult that recognized that gift in you? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I was, I always studied theater. I thought that acting was what I wanted to do. And so that's what I went to school for. And I think that I had wonderful teachers who, who really taught me about what it means to 
be a hard worker within an art, uh, which I think sometimes looks on the outside like a very messy, organic thing, but I, I like more of a clinical um, approach to art. So I had a lot of teachers who inspired my craft. But then when I was around 22 or 23, when I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, I took a class at the Gotham Writers Workshop in New York City and got that lovely, you know, coveted note at the end of a paper saying, hey, I think you're good at this. You should look more into this. And just that little nudge makes a huge difference. A huge difference. And, uh, you know, it 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 really should encourage us to, uh, you know, to encourage those around us, because, you know, sometimes the life of a writer can be lonely and uh, you know, there's some pretty dark days when you're working all alone and not knowing if this thing is working mm. or not. And that one little nugget of, of inspiration, of encouragement, man, goes such a long way. Oh, it goes so far. It reminds me of all of the, the good rejections that you right. get along the way. Um, and if someone, you know, writes you back and, and uses your name instead of dear author or says, hey, this isn't right for us this time, but you came close. That little tiny you came close goes so far and really inspires, you know, stretches of time after that. Yeah. Is it true that you used to um, carry around a baby name book with you? 100%. It did. (laughs) I was eight or nine. I think I still have it. And I carried it around in case I got bored and I would underline names that I liked and I would would star them. Um, And I think... At the time, I was playing with character a little bit in a way that didn't become clear until until my adulthood. Um, names carry so much weight and history and sometimes pain. And I think, you know, especially for me as a writer, I love starting with character and, and names are, are typically where I go to with that. that. I love that so much because, um, you know, that's one of the toughest things for me is uh, is figuring out who that character is. And part of that mm-hmm. is their name. Uh, you know, something we just take for granted. Uh, but when it's right, it's right. And we've all had one oh, of those yeah. characters that just doesn't feel alive, is a little wooden. And, and I think that's because yes. we, we haven't exactly delved deeply enough to figure out who that person is. And part of that comes from what their name means to you. Oh, yeah. How do you find your name? I'm curious. Oh, uh, you know, I don't have anything as spectacular as carrying around a baby name book. Um, it's, okay. <laughs> I, I think it's just a lot of trial and error, you know, and and, and sometimes mm-hmm. it'll be uh, maybe an historical name or something that that, it, you know, somehow mentally is tied to a character trait that I'm thinking about for them. And it, it's it's kind of weird right. like that. But um, yeah. that makes total sense to me, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Uh, so you went to the Gotham Writers Workshop and you got this encouragement. How did you, you know, start pursuing the craft after that? Uh, I feel that you know writing is so often a thing that you know makes you find other work that supports the writing habit while you do it. And so I was a nanny for a long time. I was a receptionist, and I would write in lunch breaks, and I would stay in the office every Friday night and write more. Uh, I applied to graduate school in 2015, and I got rejected from every single school I applied to. Um, And I thought, okay, let me try one more time. Uh, My now husband got a job in Arkansas, and so I moved to Fayetteville for a year. And I I worked at a coffee shop, and I wrote copy for a few magazines there while I applied to grad school again. And that's where I started really crafting this novel as well. And so luckily this time I did not get rejected from nine schools. I got into nine schools the second time around. And then I moved to Iowa City. Yeah. And I finished my uh, novel there and that was my thesis. And then I sold it in between my first and second year. You, you said that you, um, you spent time as a nanny. Um, Did that Mm -hmm. time, um, did that contribute to this novel? I mean, obviously it had to. I think that. Of course. Yeah, I think I was super inspired by the setting. Um, I'm I'm not an auto fiction writer. I so, so many authors do it so well when they write about their own life events, but I like to stick to pure fiction. But I, I don't think I couldn't have been uh, inspired by the really precarious and delicate backdrop of, of child care, particularly with mostly women of color working for, for white families. Um, and then you have a whole dynamic of class and of a child that sometimes you grow to love so much. Um, and I think that there's something really magical about the number three when it comes to characters and literature and that mother 
parent-child and babysitter relationship is so complicated. And so I was really excited to dive into those themes. Well, it, it really is complicated because you, you've got someone who spends time with this child a, a large, mm-hmm. you know, number of hours a week. And, um, you know, this, this kind of parental thing rises up inside you, even, you know, if you were, um, you know, someone hired to do a job, but most times it goes way deeper than that. Right, right. The, the, um, the parameters of what work is become really muddled. Uh, in this story, you know, Amir is a a child care taker and Alex asked her to do a lot of things. She says, you know, can you pick up Briar from ballet? Can you change the diaper? Can you make them dinner? And Amira says, yes, because that's her job. But then one night when Alex says, you know, can you have a glass of wine with me? The boundaries become a little bit um, inky because Amira yeah. feels like she can't say no. She's, you know, a low income person and she feels like, oh, this person's asking me to do something. And if I say no, it might make her think that I don't want this job as, as much as I need it. And so I have to say yes. So as a person, you know, I think that those inter- those intersections are so interesting and, and really um, kind of worrisome but as a writer. Those are my favorite moments that are so complicated. And I love kind of watching the characters deal with them. Yeah. Well, um, there, there are a few really powerful characters in this book. And um, you mentioned yeah. Alex and Amira. Um, and even though the, the book is really about Amira, um, Alex is, is a very prominent figure in this book. And, and we meet her uh, in the beginning. Uh, tell us who came first for you. Did was it Amira and then you were looking for her situation or was it Alex and then looking for the character that comes into her life? How did, how did the, the kind of dynamic of them come to be? Mm, that's such a good question. And I think it's a little bit of both. Um, uh, there was no Amira without Alex. I knew from the beginning that I wanted a babysitter and mother relationship. And so it's kind of like figuring out who would be the most fun to watch if they were put into a room together. But kind of going back to what you were saying about names, um, some characters just present themselves to you so clearly. And Amira was always Amira from the very beginning. And then it was just figuring out what her temperament was like. Um, Alex, I think I went through maybe 12 different names for her. And I started out writing uh, diary entries from Alex that were in list form and none of those made it into the novel, but I think all of those explorations into character end up serving the novel towards the end. Gotcha. Um, so, so tell us about the character of Alex. Um, who is she, mm-hmm. and and how did you, um, you know, discover who she was? Yeah, Alex is a small business owner. She's thirty three. She's from Allentown, Pennsylvania, and she lives in New York City. Uh, she's very savvy and pretty congenial. She has a tendency to overanalyze things and kind of obsess over things. But Alex really defines herself as a feminist and entrepreneur. And it's important to her to stick up for people that she feels like need her help. But Alex moves from New York to Philadelphia begrudgingly, and she's lonely. And she's kind of a victim of this late capitalist um, lifestyle of, okay, well, I'm not working right now. so, So who am I? And in that moment of missing her friends and not knowing where she is in her career, she turns to her babysitter. And that's where the boundaries get crossed a bit. Um, I think that she sees this younger woman in her house and who listens to music she doesn't listen to and, 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 you know, has a different way of speaking from her friends. And she's so intrigued, but that fascination uh, causes her to get in some trouble. Yeah. What's interesting and and one thing that I was really intrigued by in this book is that the the typical um, kind of power positions uh, are not so um, black and white. Uh, forgive the mm-hmm. the, um, the pun That's there, <laughs> um, and it didn't mean that. But um, the it, it's uh, you know Alex is a complicated character. Um, well, while, while she mm-hmm. does blur those lines, and she obviously. Um, behaves toward uh, Amira in a way that she is not sensitive to um, Amira's plight and, and uh, you know, what position she puts her in. Um, you know, I, I don't sense any malice from Alex, um, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and that she is a, um, you know, she's a character dealing with things herself. And it where while it would be so easy to to paint Alex as, 
you know, just this completely um, oblivious, um, uh, you know, person who just takes a mirror for granted. It's not quite that easy. Um, and, and you really don't right. allow us as readers to um, to just write off characters in this book because everyone's complex and three dimensional and, you know, many shades of gray. Um, is that something that right, you think right. about when you, when you are writing characters like that is, you know, I don't want this person to just be a caricature of X or Y. Um, I want them to be a fully yes. formed human being. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, when I would teach undergraduate workshops at the University of Iowa, I was teaching students who aren't writers, which is kind of my favorite demographic to teach. And we do a lot of character exercises. And one of them which I think is important for any writer at any stage is crafting two completely different characters that are total and antithesis of each other and making sure not to have a good and a bad character. Um, Cause I believe as humans, we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. And I think it's really important to show a character, to give a character a win, even though they make a lot of mistakes. So that's kind of on a surface level, but on a deeper level, I also think that racial bias works that way often um, I think it's a little easy to look at the news and see, you know, uh, a rally of, of the KKK and think that this is, you know, a depiction of what racism looks like. But I think that racial bias often comes with a smile and it comes with words like, oh, I just want my kids to go to a good school or, you know, that's a sketchy restaurant or I want my son to be with a girl from a good family. And all of those are are coded in this want for safety, but it's also rooted in classism and racism. And I think that white supremacy works that way. And I think that people often work that way too. Um, and as a writer and reader, I think that characters that are capable of loving someone and hurting someone are, are more interesting to read and also uh, more true to the human experience. Yeah. Well, and, and as you uh, so deftly, uh, you know, paint in this book that, those good families that we want our sons to date daughters of, uh, those good families are often just as jacked up as, as everybody else. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a part of growing up where I realized everyone's family is a little jacked up. So yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> everybody's a little jacked up. Um, so we've got this relationship with Alex and Amira and we see these, um, uh, you know, these actions uh, by Alex and then Amira's response to them and, and how she feels powerless in one way. Um, you know, but while also trying to, uh, you know, she tries to bring her, her boss into the modern world every chance she gets. Mm -hmm. Um, but then we've got this other thing that happens with Amira that is more prominent and more, um, kind of in your face racism. Um, tell us about mm -hmm. this kind of plot line and, and what it was that, uh, that motivated you to, to draw this part of the story. Right. So I, as a reader, can be a little impatient and I need something to hook me as soon as I start reading. And so I love a really exciting first chapter. So in the first chapter of this novel, Amira takes Briar to a high-end grocery store and it's late at night. Briar's family has had a family emergency and they just need her out of the house. So Amira and Briar are in the grocery store. They're dancing to Whitney Houston, having a good time. And then a security guard and customer upon seeing a black woman with a white child accuse her of kidnapping the child and they won't let her leave. And then someone pulls out, you know, check off cell phone in a way and, <laughs> and videotapes the entire thing. And Amira's humiliated. And this is the event that joins Amira to the family and to the young man filming for the rest of the novel. What, what, um, in, in writing that uh, scenario, um, how did you feel writing that? Uh, I have to say, um, it's funny because as I've been on tour, I've had a lot of women, both white and black, say to me, I cried in that first chapter. I loved it, but I had to stop reading it. And I'm glad that my process evoked those emotions because I think I was so ingrained in making sure that everything was like a perfectly choreographed train wreck. <laughs> that it took away some of the emotions for me. Um, I really wanted to luxuriate in the moment where the incident is first happening and Amira almost laughed it off because it seemed silly to her. Because I think that that's what happens. You're like, this, oh, this is so silly. This couldn't happen to me. I'm not going to be a hashtag. Oh, wait, there's a cell phone involved. What's going on? 
And so it was really a practice in timing out the growth of panic that she has and making sure that all of those reactions were really visceral and honest to who she was. Um, But it's also, you know, balancing when the three-year-old speaks up or how the security guard would approach her. Yeah, there was a lot of choreography and a lot of rewrites for that scene. Nice. Um, with with such a uh, dynamic, powerful first chapter, and and you know, like you said, that some readers weren't able to to make it all the way through it. Um, that that doesn't necessarily set the complete tone for the book because there's plenty of places in the book where you inject some levity, and you know, we mm-hmm. get to see the joys of life and and this you know complicated relationship that's going on. And it's it's not all bad. It's not all um, right. heavy handed and, and, um, you know, just morose. Um, there's, there's happy life in that too. Um, can you talk a little bit about balancing that, uh, that dynamic, uh, you know, emotional, powerful scenes with, uh, some more you know, just glimpses of, of regular life and relationships that do work on some level? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I think that this is going to sound so cheesy, but that is just how life goes so often is that, you know, you may be having a terrible day babysitting and then the the kid says something hilarious and it just changes your entire mood. And my favorite types of art are the kind that try and do more than one thing. And I think it's so possible to write a book that comments on uh, how technology presents racial biases to us in a new way but also have a story with a really sweet relationship between a 25 year old and a three year old that she babysits. Um, I love genre bendy types of art. And I thought, you know, I could cover issues of class warfare, but also have like a romantic comedy meet cute that makes people kind of squirm and giggle when they read it. Um, I love humor and writing. And I also find that these things aren't as separate as people make them seem. Um, I find that, those awkward, cringy moments are often really funny or someone's reaction to it can be funny too. And so finding the truth of these moments was actually often the thing that made the levity come out as well. Um, I think in any case, when you're working with children, you have to remember that levity because they are so funny um, and intelligent. And so, yeah, I really hope that those elements came out as well. Well, and, and children will be, um, funny at the most inappropriate times and, you know, completely (laughs) take you off guard. And, and, uh, I love that about the book. Um, you, uh, you got your MFA, uh, from the Iowa writers workshop. Is that right? I did. I did. Yeah. The, the, the MFA program is, is, uh, something that really draws a line with writers. Some people, um, you know, are, are not for that at all and think, Oh, the, you know, that will stifle your creativity, you know, quicker than anything. And then other people, um, you know, that this experience just really unlocks their potential. Um, where do mm-hmm. you fall on and, and how do you feel that the MFA, um, you know, enhanced your writing? Oh, I love, I love the MFA debate by the way. I could talk about that all day. <laughs> I think it's so interesting. Um, I feel that I can only obviously only speak to my experience. And I went into the MFA program when I was 30 years old. And by that time, I had had many jobs as a nanny, receptionist, a copywriter, a hostess, camp counselor. And so by the time that I got to the MFA, the fact that I could write full time, um, that was the most unbelievable gift I could receive as a writer. Um, I just had space and time to work out these plot points and make characters really bulletproof. And I would don't think I would have a novel right now if I did not have the MFA. Um, I will say that, you know, and, and this is from someone who does enjoy school. I think the biggest surprise to me about the MFA was that I didn't go into the program and then go to all these classes and learn a lot of things. It's more about you learning about your tendencies as a writer. You definitely have to be a lot more driven than I, than I had anticipated, but Thankfully, I you know had experience working before, and so that worked out great for me. I do have a hot take that I just don't feel that you should get an MFA unless they are paying you to do it. I don't think anyone should go into debt getting one, um, but I had a really great experience and professors that changed the way that I approach literature, and so I had a great experience. And you were selected for the Truman Capote Fellowship. Um, what what did that mean for you, and and what did that give you? 
Oh man. And my first year when I had that fellowship, it was just, uh, the, the most wonderful thing to give someone who's about to tackle a novel. Um, I was so thrilled to be in a position with other writers who were in, you know, with, within other fellowships that could read my writing and tell me when to start over and, and not. And I think that the biggest thing the fellowship give, gave me in terms of time was the freedom to fail really early and often and not worry so much about getting things 100% when I first tackled it, but really working things out in a way that I hadn't had the chance to do so before. Um, such a fun age. The new book was selected uh, as a Reese Witherspoon uh, book club, uh, Hello Sunshine pick. And, you know, Reese has had uh, some, some pretty great, um, you know, yeah. luck with, with some book club picks that, that have gone on to be very successful TV shows. Uh, and and such a fun age was optioned for for TV. Is that right? It was, yes. Very exciting. That's got to be a crazy feeling, you know. You've got this book that that it's you totally cared crazy. so much about, and you know it really you know, is an outpouring of you. And then to to not only have readers that you know appreciate it, but then you know someone say, "I I really want to translate this for screen." Um, how do you navigate those waters? Oh man, I, I'm doing it as we speak. <laughs> it's really <laughs> exciting. But I will say, uh, when I first workshopped this novel, I was in the novel workshop with Paul Harding, which was wonderful. And when I walked in, one of my friends said, okay, I've cast your entire book. Do you want to know who should play who? And I thought that was such a great reaction. And I thought, okay, maybe there's something cinematic to this, but I could have never dreamed that someone would actually take the steps to make that happen. Uh, both both Reese Witherspoon and Lena Waithe are such wonderful advocates for storytelling and also have a heart to protect new writers and, and show them how to do these things. So the great thing is I don't know how to navigate this, but I have a lot of people helping me and I really couldn't be in better hands. Um, what's the best advice you've ever been given uh, about writing? Oh man. Uh, that's such a good question. Uh, Jeff Walter said to write to your obsessions. And I think that there's really something to that. I've also learned in the publication process, uh, writing a book takes such a long time. Getting it published takes such a long time. You have to be brave on the page and tell life how you see it and speak to your obsessions and no one else's because you're going to be in a position to stand up for them. Um, with this novel, I'm obsessed with dialogue. It's very clear. And I love when dialogue is written exactly the way that it's heard. And I definitely had editors and agents say that they wanted me to pull back on the slang or not write things uh, misspelled. And that was one area that I had to fight to have it. And now it's really wonderful at readings. I hear black women tell me, um, you know, I've never seen myself in a book like this, or this is how me and my friends talk. And so writing to my obsession of the truth of dialogue brought those moments about, and I'm really glad that I did. Well, dialogue is one of those things that just has to be perfect. And, and when it I is, and, and, and when it's really perfect, it jumps off the page and makes you feel like you have been part of the story. And I, I often wonder about, uh, you know, some of the arguments that, that people have with editors about dialogue, because, you know, uh, we tell people, you know, read your dialogue aloud. How does it sound? Does it sound real? Is this something, mm. is this a conversation someone would have? And, and, you know, you had the guts to, to actually make it real. And, um, you know, I applaud you for that. And, uh, it, but, but it, it's, it's sad that. That, that we're still having these arguments about, you know, making dialogue real enough or not. It's so interesting, but I think, you know, the way that I try to look at it whenever those conversations come around is that language is so emotion filled and, and does something to people. And if you're going to have really uh, accurate language, some people will need to put the book down for a minute because they get so angry. Um, so I feel like uh, really giving honor to what language can do is, is scary, but also extremely necessary. Absolutely. Uh, the new book, Such a Fun Age, is out everywhere now. It's been out for uh, just about a month now. Um, it's available in paperback and Kindle edition, uh, an audiobook also. Um, we're going to have links to it in the show notes where everyone can grab their copy of it. Um, Kylie, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, is there a place where they can connect with you online? 
Yes, I'm still on tour and my website, KylieReed.com, has all that information. And I'm also available on Instagram at Kylie Reed. Excellent. I'll put links to those as well. Um, Kylie, this has been so much fun uh, chatting today and uh, we wish you the best of luck on the book. Um, are you still carrying around your uh, baby name book for trying to you meet know new characters? <laughs> I'm not, but now I miss it. I think I might go find it and take it back on tour with me. That's a great idea. I think you need to do that. That'd be great. Yeah, me uh, too. <laughs> yeah. Kylie, uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. The Near Future. Humanity's only hope of survival entered the solar system at nearly the speed of light. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy, and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making, choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. 
Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? He murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right. Dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> how? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night, and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? He asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him, where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to his ear, Mark stopped and looked around before deciding how to continue. Spiked ocotillo plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? He asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk. Decayed wood. Used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? He asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.